pray with me this morning? Yes, Lord, we were once your enemy. Now we're seated at your table. Thank you. And great are you, Lord, as we've sang this morning. We praise your name. There is none like you. Lord, I thank you that we can meet as a body here this morning. Father, there's much going on amongst us in our body that we need your help with. There's a lot going on in our world, Lord, that you are completely aware of, but we just want to petition you this morning. Lift up our country and its leaders. Lord, you are the creator and author of life. Your word talks about how we're knitted together in our mother's womb. Lord, as a country, we have sinned against you millions and millions of times, taking lives that you've created. Lord, I thank you for these justices who had the courage to overturn a decision that went directly against you years ago. Lord, I just pray for protection for them and put a hedge about them, Lord. Thank you for what they've done. Give each of us the courage to stand for truth and to be able to do it with love and grace. Lord, I just lift up the needs of the body. I think of people here this morning dealing with cancer and other sicknesses. I think of Larry here and Janet, Scott. Lord, I just ask for you to heal their bodies. Think of Ruth this morning who's struggling, Lord. Help Ruth and the doctors to figure out what's going on there. And pray that you would heal her. We think of the Overhouse family, Jim and his, his family that is still grieving loss of his son. Help them during this time. We pray for the upcoming youth trip, Lord, that you will prepare the way for them. Give them a great week of serving you. Pray for the Yows in Germany. Just not only meet all their needs, but bless them abundantly. They serve you. Lord, be with Pastor Paul as he speaks to us this morning. Lord, help him with this topic to speak truth and to speak clearly. Help us to have open hearts. Again, Lord, we love you because you are a great and awesome God who has brought us to yourself, and we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, if you have any children here that you do not want to sit through this topic, uh, it will be this week and next for sure. Um, Rachel is back here waiting for, um, for them. Randy, no, not you. Okay, you you stay in. You stay in. Man. They're going, yeah! Talk on this all the time. Now we're going to pull out the donuts. <laughs> Lies that we buy. Um, the next two weeks, it's, uh, the topic is really somewhere over the rainbow. The lies that we buy, the issues that we're kind of talking about in general, really fall into two camps. Um, the lies that um, unbelievers buy 
that keep them in darkness and the lies that believers buy that keep them in bondage. And sometimes those two categories overlap. They spill into the church and create controversy, division, and strife. Now, the universal church is big enough um, to deal with the differences on, on different uh, doctrinal issues. But when it comes to the gospel, there cannot be any fellowship if a different gospel is being preached. The early church struggled with the same invasion of ideas, doctrines, and practices that diverted them away from the gospel and threatened to undermine their faith. Paul said this, he said, For if someone comes and proclaims another Jesus than we, the one we proclaimed, or if you receive a different spirit from the one you received, or if you accept a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it readily enough. And so they were putting up with these different doctrines. He says to the Galatians, he says, not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. Now, within the series that we are focusing on, that is, the lies that we buy, I'll be spending the next couple of weeks in a sub-series um, entitled Somewhere Over the Rainbow, the Gospel of Diversity and Inclusion. Now, I planned to, I planned to preach this uh, summer on the, on the topic of social issues that I'm afraid to preach. Not that I'm really fearful, but they are uh, emotionally... Um, can be emotionally uh, explosive topics, and so um, I've, I haven't decided whether or when to preach that, but eventually it'll happen. But the topic that I'm addressing uh, in the next couple of weeks is kind of intersects these two series. And in the present climate of our culture and in our community, I, I just felt that it was time to address it uh, for our, our body. So to be absolutely clear, I'll be addressing um, the lies associated with the LGBTQ community. I sometimes put extra letters in that. Now, a topic that once was seen as right and wrong has now permeated every crevice of our society, where protesters used to uh, go out and, and call for their, their individual rights they are now trying to immerse everyone in it, like it or not. So uh, during this solidarity um, with the Pride Month, uh, my, my blog app on my phone changed its colors to be a multicolor design to promote Pride Month. Other apps have done the same thing. Now, I, I did contact um, through email uh, the, what, uh, the WordPress company, told them my displeasure, told them that I was offended by the fact that they are forcing this on me, and they have not responded. Now, I know this issue can be emotional for some, uh, because you may have family members who have chosen a gay lifestyle, and most of us know somebody who is wrestling with gender dysphoria in some form or another. Now, I'll try to be sensitive to that as much as possible without compromising the truth. Now, this issue has brewed for a long time. It's complex and it's multifaceted. It's not just about one lie. It's about several lies. And so here's a list of the lies that <clears throat> surround this topic. It is, truth is relative. The Bible's teaching is irrelevant. The Bible's teaching is for a different culture and time. The Bible doesn't teach that homosexuality is a sin. Tolerance is acceptance. Disagreement is bigotry. God made me this way, then I must be all right. Genetics is not amoral. Homosexuality and its accompanying variations are victimless. It's seen in, in many animal species, then it must be okay in ours. Now, those are lies that, um, that people in the LGBTQ community have bought into. But there are some lies that uh, Christians also buy into regarding this topic. And one would be homosexual temptations are a sin. We'll, we'll get into that. Um, we shouldn't be loving towards those who struggle with same-sex attraction. 
people with same-sex attraction have no place in the church. And most of the people choose the gay lifestyle. I'll address these topics in a broad sense. I know it's a lot there for just two weeks. We may go into three. But I will try to um, put them on a little bit more in depth on my weekly blog. I want to start with symbols, because symbols are important. They represent um, whatever the symbol is for. But the problem is, is that when you have different symbols, there are people who will take symbols and then co-opt it for its own use. Sometimes good, sometimes not. This one is Procter & Gamble. Now, if you're older like me, you'll remember in the 80s um, that people were, that the cult watchers uh, had deemed this one to be satanic. And so they started to really create this commotion within the community, the the Christian community. It has man of the moon, two horns on each side, 13 stars, and of course the inverted 666, which kind of put a nail in the coffin for um, uh, cult watchers. And as much as Procter & Gamble would, would decry that's not what this is about, it didn't make any difference. And eventually they ended up getting rid of it and and starting a new one. Now, the following uh, symbols are ones that you will know. Most of them are from the Bible, one's not. Uh, The first one is a dove. You know, this was originally, um, you know, God had a dove uh, that that he sent off from the ark. But in the scriptures, the the dove symbolizes the Holy Spirit. In the Old Testament, sometimes it is viewed as, as hovering over the face of the earth. In the New Testament, it was uh, it manifested at Jesus' baptism. And the Song of Solomon describes God's relationship with his people like a dove. It has been adopted by the peace movement. Nothing wrong with that, right? It's just they saw this and used it for something different. This one here. Now, some people will look at that and go, oh, I know what that is. I used to wear this on my jeans. It's a peace symbol. Do you realize that this symbol was originated in 1950? It was um, by a British campaign for nuclear disarmament. It was then co-opted by the peace movement and the, and the hippie movement in the 60s and just meant peace. Not bad. Uh, the cross. The cross originally stood as, an ex- as a symbol of excruciating death. But Christians, after Jesus' resurrection, co-opted it, and it became a symbol of hope and salvation. And, of course, that brings us to the rainbow. The rainbow started when God promised no longer to destroy the earth by a flood, and he puts the rainbow in the sky as a reminder that he will not do that again. But it's been co-opted by the LGBTQ community to represent diversity, acceptance, and inclusion. Now, the problem with communication is is that you can use the same words and mean completely different things. An example would that be is that if someone came up to you and said, uh, would you like some chips, you would think potato chips. If you were in England and they said, would you like some chips, they would get French fries, right? Um, And so we can use the same words, but depending on the culture and the place, I have in my notes here, it says, boring, I know it, you know. They're just definitions, because we need definitions to know what we're talking about. The next one is love. Um, love, I want to define what I mean by love when I talk about it. In the, in the English language, we have one word for love. In the Greek, there's three main ones. There's a fourth one, but three main ones. The first one is eros, which is an erotic love. And then there's phileo, which is a friendship love. And then there's agape. And agape love is acting on behalf of another person for their good, regardless of how it makes either party feel. So Jesus said, there is no greater agape than this, that a man lays his life down for a friend. Love is compassionate, and it is discipline. Acceptance. Acceptance is not only does it acknowledge what is essential for somebody else, it embraces what they embrace. Now, acceptance can be uh, looked at two ways. One, acceptance can be just accepting the part of something. Like I might accept, uh, I might like white birthday cake, but not white frosting. So I accept the birthday cake. I'll just scrape off the white frosting. 
Or it can be seen as that if you accept part of it, you accept all of it. You won't know what a person means by which kind of acceptance he has unless you are in a conversation with them. That brings us to the, the, uh, the tolerance, because tolerance in our culture today really has taken on the notion of acceptance. If someone says to you, well, you just need to be more tolerant, what they really mean is that you need to accept what I'm talking about. You need to embrace it. But that is the opposite of what tolerance is. Tolerance is disagreeing with somebody, yet being able to get along. So when I talk to people who, who um, have a different a, a, um, a point of view than I do on a certain topic, I would say, well, I'm going to be tolerant because we disagree, but we're brothers or we, we're friends and we can get along. The next one is fellowship. Fellowship has two parts to it. It's casual and formal. And if a person is living in willful disobedience to God, uh, he cannot have fellowship with the people of God, the formal and deep fellowship. Yet they can have casual fellowship, which just might mean you inviting them to your home or to a, a large group event. But formal fellowship is around the Lord's Supper. It's discipleship. It's prayer. And then, of course, finally, homosexuality. Homosexuality is the practice of sexual behavior between members of the same sex, regardless of how they identify their gender. Homosexuality is not equivalent to same-sex attraction. Same-sex attraction is the temptation, not the sin. Now, the first one um, is kind of expanded, and, and I, I put my own twist on it. And the reason why was because I was watching this video of someone in the community, a young lady who has uh, identified herself with being male. Okay? She's, uh, but she likes girls. And so she considers herself a heterosexual. Wrap your head around that. All right? Because she, can, she identifies as a male, liking girls, she's heterosexual. That's a lie. They're both girls. It's a homosexual, lesbian relationship. It has nothing to do with gender. Now, the second part of this, in terms of same-sex attraction, there are people, and I've, I've known them, who would not have chosen to have an attraction for the same sex because of all the things that come with it, but they still have it. But they don't act on it because they know that that would be sinful. So the attraction is a temptation. It's not the acting out of it. That, is, that would be the sin. So keep that in mind as we go along, because I'll be talking more about that uh, in, in the sermon to come. Now that we have a few definitions, we're going we're gonna to tackle the first lie, all right? The first, actually, the first two lies. And the first two lies are these. Truth is relative and is determined by society, feelings, and situations. And secondly, the scriptures are from a thousands of years ago and are, are irrelevant for today. Those are the two that we're going to tackle today because they are foundational. If we do not... If we buy into these lies, then we might as well not talk about any of the rest of it because it won't really make any difference. So our doctrinal statement, this is what we believe as a church about the Scriptures. We believe that the Scriptures of the New, Old and New Testament are wholly inspired by God, infallible, and the only supreme and final authority in faith and life. Now most of us here would go, yeah, that's a given. That's what we believe. But yet, when issues that are clearly right and wrong become, uh, come into close proximity to us in our families, in our communities, in our schools, we start to ask questions. But often the questions aren't about the behavior, it's about the scriptures. Instead of talking about the behavior, we often ask these kinds of questions. We'll ask a question like, if the scripture says that those who practice homosexuality behavior are going to hell, and my friend or family member lives out this lifestyle, how can a loving God judge them? That's the question that is typically asked. Or, if God has created me this way, how can he reject me from heaven? So we don't start with the question of, is the behavior right or wrong? we start to think, well, maybe the Scriptures isn't. For us, 
we want to know everything. Because we think that if we could just know everything, know all the secrets, what God is really talking about when he does that, that we will feel better. Because that's what we want. We want to feel good about what God is doing. And we think that if we know more information, then we will feel better. But the problem is, is that God doesn't tell us everything. The secret things belong to him. And what he has revealed to us belong to us and our children. And so that we can be obedient to the law. For us to expect that God will open up the heavens and give us more information so that we can feel good about ourselves is we're going to be opening ourselves up for disappointment. God has revealed enough for us to form knowledgeable opinions. I mean, in fact, if we had put half of what we know into practice, we would be 100% better off as Christians. But to faithfully navigate life as a Christian, we need to give Scripture the priority it deserves. Because we can change how we feel about the Scriptures, but we can never change the Scriptures. Doctrine should dictate our behavior, not the other way around. So what does it mean then when Paul says that the Scriptures are inspired? He says that all Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, and training in righteousness. And then in Peter, knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's interpretation, for no prophecy is ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Just as God breathed life into Adam, he breathes life into the words of the people that he had write them. Now, people will often uh, question inspiration of the Scripture because they look at it and they go, it's so many different people. It's so many different genres, so many different um, characteristics in it, so many different years and languages. Why didn't God just give us one thing that is completely by one person? But he didn't. He worked through all these things. But the diversity of the way that God presented it to us does not do away with inspiration. It magnifies it. Because there is no way without God's inspiration that over 6,000 years or so with 66 books, so many different authors and cultures and language to have one cohesive message throughout the whole book of the Bible. It's impossible without. And if you were to get five people in the room and tell them to all write on the same subject, they would come out with different things, but not with the Scriptures. Now, in, that's inspiration. It's a short um, explanation of that. Inerrancy is about the Bible's accuracy, because liberals and unbelievers love to point to what seems to be errors in the Scriptures. And they want to do that to prove that the Bible is inaccurate. But most of the time, the inaccuracy is either a cultural thing that we don't understand, or it might be contextual, or it might just be clerical error. If the context cannot explain it, or the culture can't explain it, then the problem is not with the Scriptures. It's with, with our understanding. We don't know enough. And God will make it clear in His own timing. But when we come to the Scriptures, we come to it with our own presupposition. In other words, if you come to the Scriptures with the presupposition is, is that it's not the Word of God and that it has errors, guess what? You will, find, you will find them. And you'll pick out as many as you can. And you'll come with explanations about it. But if you come with a presupposition that it is the Word of God, you will, you will go to those passages and come with an explanation that will help to defend why those aren't um, errors. But if you come with a presupposition that it's not the Word of God, then you will rationalize and say, you're just making up things to make you feel good about it. You see, it all comes down to how we approach it through a presuppositional framework. So here's this one guy, and he comes to it with the presupposition that there's errors in the Bible. And this is what he says. One of my favorite contradictions is 1 Samuel 17, 50 through 51. Two verses. The first of these verses emphasize that David killed Goliath without a sword. The next verse says that David picked up a, a sword and killed him with it. This is a tiny and insignificant detail. Kill him with a stone, pick up a sword, cut off his head, versus knock him down with a stone, pick up a sword, kill him, and cut off his head with it. 
It doesn't even change the story itself to any degree worth bothering with, except that it's a wonderfully concise contradiction of absolute literal inerrancy. Here's the passage. Because he's not, he's not incorrect. His, his conclusion is incorrect, but he's not incorrect. Uh, so David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone and smote the Philistine and slew him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore David ran and stood upon the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of the sheath and thereof and slew him and cut, cut off his head in addition to that. And when the Philistines saw it, their champion was dead, they fled. That's the contradiction. Did he kill him with a sword? Or did he kill him with a stone? Uh, the author of this says it really doesn't make any difference, but it's great because it proves that the, that the Bible is inaccurate. Now, the word for um, slew there in the Hebrew, it's not that. It's this. It, 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 mean, it has a broad meaning. It's not just real narrow. It has a broad meaning. But in every case, it does mean to slay or kill. But it can also be a euphemism. David killed him with a stone, but slew his honor, slew his dignity, slew his power before the people of the Philistines, and they ran away. Uh, that, that is a reasonable explanation to it. Now, someone who comes with a presupposition that it, it is a contradiction won't buy that. They'll see it as rationalizing away. But it is a reasonable, a reasonable explanation to that within the context, within the culture, within the language. Now, if your presupposition is that the Word of God is infallible, uh, then you can explain things like this. Now, the issue of relevancy. So that's, we have inspiration, we have infallibility, which is the accuracy of it, and then we have, lastly, we have relevancy. Is the Scripture relevant today? A book that has been written over periods of thousands of years, and we have the canon today, which is the group of books that we say are Scriptures, that has been closed for at least another thousand years. So how can a book so old be relevant today? Liberals don't say that other books are irrelevant. Matter of fact, they will quote books like Shakespeare or Emerson Waldo. They'll even quote the Bible if it makes them feel good, if it, if it fits into their worldview. But to say that it is relevant today means that it, you have to apply all of it to you. Now, the issue of relevancy uh, is, in terms of what we're talking about, is that do we then have to obey everything the Bible teaches? And the answer to that is no. So how do we know which we are to uh, be obedient to and which we're not? Because sometimes God does write things in a very contextual way to be applied to just a few people or a culture or a nation. So how do we reconcile these things? Because if we say that things are cultural, cannot the gay community say that homosexuality is contextual? That it is that what they were writing about was completely different than what they know today? Because if it is, then how do we reconcile the cultural things? I'll give you a couple examples. Should, uh, in terms of cultural things, should we be obedient to the Ten Commandments? We look at the Ten Commandments and we ask the question, you know, should we apply that to our life? And we go, the first one, you know, he goes, thou shall not murder. It's not the first one, but it says, thou shall not murder. And we go, that's right. We shouldn't murder. Inside, intrinsically, we go, yes, it's wrong to do that. Do not covet your neighbor's wife. It, it, intrinsically, we believe that. The other way that we know that the Old Testament is um, uh, applicable to us is that the New Testament repeats it. So the New Testament repeats something that the Old Testament says we should obey, then we know to obey that. But it, but it becomes still a little sticky because what if something is cultural and what is not? The Ten Commandments can be easy, but what about this one? My favorite one. Should women wear head coverings? Right? Obviously not here. <laughs> you know, uh, but should women wear head coverings? Because when you go, because, because most of the time, the Christians, the conservative Christians will say, well, no, that was, that's cultural. That's cultural. Well, we've got to be careful about that. If we say that's cultural, 
why cannot gays say that homosexuality is cultural? If you go into the scriptures and you ask the question, is it cultural? Paul does not make a cultural argument. His argument's from creation. Right? It's not from culture. So the question is, if his argument's not from culture but creation, then should women wear head coverings at least when they pray? Because that's what I think the context is, praying in public. Randy, can you come up and explain this now, the rest of this? Okay. No, 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 no. Well, typically what, what we do in, in conservative Christianity is we say, well, what they're talking about there is that the hair is the covering. And we get around it. And we say, that's why women can't be bald, because then they don't have a head covering. I think that's thin. I think that's a thin, uh, not the hair, but I think the argument is thin. Because I think what he's saying is that, and I really believe this is what the passage is saying. And then you might ask me, well, then why don't you make us all? And I said, have you ever talked to my wife? You know, um, but I think that he is really saying that in the church, women who pray publicly should be wearing head coverings. I think that's what he's saying. It's not a cultural argument. And, and from my perspective, it's not hair. But we can have, we can have and I say the, the church is big enough. But if we start to say that those things are cultural, we have to be very careful because we're opening up a door. Just because we don't want people to wear head coverings is not a good argument for saying that we shouldn't. We might choose not to, but the passage, I think, is kind of clear. And we can, the elders and I can talk about that later. Um, So the lie, the truth is relative, is a lie because we have been given one truth. And that is Jesus. Jesus says, I am the way and the truth. He is the truth. And all scriptures point to him. Therefore, the scriptures is the foundation for our life. It is the truth that holds us together as a body of believers. The Holy Spirit uses it to work and to convict us that we might walk in a manner worthy of the kingdom of God. That is our truth. It is not relative. It is not our feelings. It is not about anything else but objective truth. And that's important because as soon as we say that it depends on the situation or our feelings, then then basically we decide that the truth is based on something else. But we are determined that the Scripture is true. And the reason why I think that it's difficult is because for people to accept that the Scripture is truth is because sometimes it's hard and it doesn't make us feel good. And we live in a culture that wants to feel good. The second lie is that Scripture is old and isn't relevant for us today. If we believe that the first premise is true, then we have to believe that the second is. People who say that the Bible is not relevant pick and choose what they want to apply. I was sitting with a priest. This was at a Catholic high school. And we were talking, and he was was telling me about why it was important to always be studying the Bible. Because I asked him what he did. And he said, well, I spend a lot of time studying the Bible. So why? Because we never can really know what is true. So we're always having to try to figure out what is the truth beneath the words. And I said, oh. I said, does God love you? He says, yes, he does. I said, how do you know? He says, well, because the Bible tells us. I said, well, how do you know that that's true? He excused himself and had to go someplace. Because to accept, to accept the truth That God loves us because the Word says means we have to take seriously everything that the Word of God says. The first lie that the Bible is not objective truth, but is relative to any situation and feeling falls short because God does not change. He never changes. He said, for I, the Lord, do not change. King David said, but you are the same and your years have no end. Numbers, God is not a man that he should lie, or the son of man that he should change his mind. He said it, and will he not do it? 
It is the unalterable character and the steadfast love of God that allows us to trust Him today and tomorrow. Because we know that He doesn't change. We know that He's not like us. He's not capricious, that He just changes by whim. We know it. And when the Word of God is pitted against the wisdom of man, I will stand every time with the Apostle Paul who said, By no means let God be true, though everyone were a liar, as it is written, that you may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. The second lie, the Scripture is not relevant, is a decision that people make so that they do not have to obey the will of God. They love to live in ignorance. And the more they persist in that sin, the more that God actually becomes weary of them. Malachi says this, You have wearied the Lord with your words, but you say, How have we wearied him? By saying, Everyone who does evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and he delights in them. Does that sound like today? He becomes weary when we try to make evil good. And his patience will not always last. Now next week we're going to look at four different lies. We're going to look at the Bible isn't, act, doesn't actually teach the homosexual, that homosexuality is a sin. That will be the bulk of what we're looking at. Tolerance is acceptance. Disagreement is bigotry. And God made me this way, then I must be all right. We don't, we're not looking at this topic because we want to be hateful. And we'll talk about what bigotry is. We talk about it because of the truth of Scripture. And we talk about it because if we continue not to say anything, as I tell my staff, silence is agreement. And so we are making a statement today and this week about where we stand on this issue. Not to alienate, just to define. And we'll talk about what it means to love the people that um, are caught up in this lifestyle. Because that's what we're called to do. We're not called to judge them. We're called to love them. And we'll be looking at that in the coming weeks. Let's pray. Father, your word is very clear on a lot of things. And there's nothing else. It's that it has authority over our lives. Father, we love you, and we thank you that grace is free, forgiveness is abundance, and that we too would be condemned to an eternity in hell if it wasn't for your son, Jesus. We are not better. Our sin is different. Help us. Help us to be compassionate and loving that people will come to know you and to love you like we do. Father, we just thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.